those. All righty. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of One Plus One, your place for inconvenient truth telling and myth busting. And on the program, we are rejoined by Bernita L. Haynes, who is a uh, consumer protection lawyer, environmental lawyer. By day and by night, she is a wonderful indie sci-fi fantasy uh, author. And we're here to talk about, uh, well, all sorts of things, depending how much time we have. So first off, <laughs> Bernita, thanks, uh, thanks so much for coming back on the program. Thanks for having me on again. It's been a while. Yes, and it's always an honor to uh, and, and it's always an honor to have you on. And apologies to our audience who usually love it when it's when, when it's you right next to L. Jones, but wasn't able to to get that. But anywho, there's always always another time, and we and we still love you. We uh you know as a you know as a one on one guest on one plus mm-hmm. one. So <laughs> <laughs> so Vernita, the first question I wanted to uh, uh, talk to you is uh, now. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the uh, Supreme Court of the United States, didn't they overturn affirmative action? Mm-hmm. That's right. That was oh. last summer, I believe. Oh, mm-hmm. yes. They were on a uh, they were on a, uh, a massacre roll. The, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the Supreme Court. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and actually and and actually that's it's and, and, and that's actually the first question I wanted to ask you, which is explain to to our international audience uh, in, 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 who, who don't know what affirmative action is. And, and, and yeah, so yes, explain to our audience what, what affirmative action is, uh, the Supreme Court repealing it, and then I'll get to my, uh, to, to my follow-up question on, the, on affirmative action. So go right ahead. Yeah, so, you know, affirmative action is essentially uh, um, legislation that was passed basically on the heels of the civil rights movement that uh, requires uh, employers, um, educational systems, and so forth to account for uh, different diversity factors in hiring and acceptance and so forth. Not necessarily preference, um, but to account for uh, levels of diversity and to meet certain standards of diversity. Um, So very commonly brought up as as an issue by opponents in the education space with folks feeling like they were passed over for acceptance into certain elite universities while lesser qualified diverse candidates were accepted. That's generally how it's always been characterized by opponents. Similar for hiring practices, it's often been characterized by opponents as a system that allows less qualified diverse folks to be hired over more qualified non-diverse folks. Um, But essentially, affirmative action is just a system that uh, requires entities to account for diversity uh, in their hiring, in their acceptance rates, and so forth. And it's a pretty, the the parameters around it, from my understanding, were pretty loose. It wasn't really strict in terms of you have to have this many uh, folks um, of a certain background. Quotas were not necessarily affirmative action, Um, but opponents often made it seem like affirmative action equaled quota. Interesting. And what would you say was the dominant propaganda about affirmative uh, action? Because, uh, and, 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 and would you say that that, 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 that propaganda, the, the anti-affirmative action uh, propaganda, would you, do you think that that, that that's also impacted a lot of left-leaning people and even well-meaning liberal-minded folks. And what I mean by that is, you know, because you were already saying that, uh, and, you know, let's not be around the bush. You had lots of white people complaining that they got uh-huh. passed over for a job that they were, that they, that they were more than qualified and it was given to a less deserving women, often less deserving women of, uh, color and so forth. <laughs> and, uh, and that whole issue of positive discrimination, and 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 I think a lot of and, and I think because there was such a because there was such a groundswell of this anti-affirmative action 
messaging coming from, you know, uh, you know, coming from the right wing, coming from, you know, the racists and so forth, that it impacted a lot of people who actually should have defended affirmative action. Yes, they could, they, 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 they uh, you know, more than welcome to always argue for a much better policy. But would you say that a lot of the anti-affirmative action propaganda even infected people who should have been defending affirmative action rather than conceding to the to to the reactionary right wing, you know what? Yeah, that's true. That uh, there there is something wrong with affirmative action. There is something wrong with positive discrimination. Well, not only were some of the people who should have been defending affirmative action ceding arguments to the right, many of them were allowing themselves to be used as puppets of the right wing uh, uh, crusade against against affirmative action, namely. Well, I'll start with a couple of demographics that seem to be the loudest voices besides white men against affirmative action. Let's start with white women. They were they have they have always been the loudest voices against affirmative action. Um, going back to like the Fisher v. Texas case that was, I think, 2010 or something like that, 2011. Um, despite them being the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action, white women. The biggest beneficiaries of a policy that was really ultimately meant um, to be beneficial for Black Americans, right? Everybody who is not a white male, but especially Black Americans. White women, biggest opponents, biggest beneficiaries. Asian community is the second most dominant voice against affirmative action. Um, and we saw that with the Supreme Court case that eventually um, allowed for the dismantling of affirmative action. It's a fascinating thing. Because these same groups, a lot of them would not be where they are without affirmative action. I'm not sure how many white women realize that they would not be filling the ranks of various law firms and universities and so forth were it not for affirmative action, which was fought for by Black folks in particular. I don't understand how uh, a significant portion of the Asian American community seems to fail to understand that they themselves would not be filling the ranks of various uh, firms and so forth and elite universities were it not for affirmative action. But for some reason, these two groups seem to be the most eager to allow themselves to be used as puppets in the fight against affirmative action. And unfortunately, they were ultimately successful. Unbelievable. And uh, now, uh, when you, you know, when when doing some research, you know about yourself and uh, you, you know about you, uh, I I actually read an article that you that you did long time ago where you actually were defending affirmative action and talk about that and uh, yeah, uh, talk about that article because uh, because it's also you know very you know autobiographical and yeah, talk to us about that one defending affirmative action. Yeah, I think you're talking about the article that I wrote uh, for Inside Higher Education, and I, Inside Higher Education, I believe it was 2012-ish that I wrote that article. I was in my last year of law school, I know that much. And, um, and in that article, I talked about how affirmative action helped me and benefited me because I am not ashamed to acknowledge that I did not come from a background of privilege where it was easy for me to access um, university and, and so forth. And so I know that affirmative action was instrumental. I got scholarships based on diversity um, to undergrad as well as to grad school and law school. And so in that article, I talked about how as a freshman, I was often the only person in my uh, classes who was black and one, during that first semester, one professor actually brought up the topic of affirmative action. We had just read this book by, um, oh, what's his name? He's horrible. It's a book called Losing the Race. Um, it's by uh, ugh, what, John McWhorter. He's horrible. Um, and I, I keep me on record saying that he's horrible. Wait, um, isn't, but, but isn't he isn't he a black commentator very popular. Oh yeah, he is, but he's generally he generally pairs right wing talking points. And this book, Losing the Race, was really incendiary in terms of being anti um affirmative action and anti just like uh understanding the role of uh 
racial discrimination and test score differences and, and test score, to, you know, disparities and so forth. It was it was just a really annoying book, but it got the, the professor on the topic of affirmative action. And I just remember how very, how vehemently the white students in class and particularly the white women students in class just whined and complained about the fact that there were some students of color who had gotten in just because they were black or whatever and they probably got scholarships and I come from a poor family too and I didn't get scholarships just because I'm a certain color all of these notions that they had that we were literally there on a free ride I may have gotten some scholarships but I did not get into undergrad and on a free ride per se and even if I did I cannot help it if you and your white family have somehow not figured out how to utilize your white privilege to your benefit. That sounds like a personal fucking problem to me. Um, but anyway, it was a very annoying moment in class. And it was one of those things that made me realize how I was probably being perceived by most of these students. I could care less because at the end of the day, I knew who I was and I knew what I wanted to achieve through my education. And I didn't really care what anybody else thought about me in that respect. Um, but that article that you're mentioning, I talk about that and I talk about just like the particular background that I come from that really was going to require that I got some sort of scholarships through uh, affirmative action type policies that would allow me to, you know, actually be mobile instead of just being stuck in my working class background, be able to actually shift from working class to middle class and so forth. Affirmative action was necessary for that kind of movement, class movement. Um, but I'll stop there because you might have more questions about that article. Well, uh, but, well, for for me, what's for for me, what, when this when when the Supreme Court when when this issue was brought up to to, to the Supreme Court and the Supreme mm -hmm. Court overturned it do, do you th do you think that a lot of the uh you know the left in the u.s whether it's the black left the latinx left uh uh feminist groups were, were a lot of them vocal in defending affirmative action or did they completely drop the ball on this due to so much of the propaganda that you laid out about affirmative action that 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 at some mm -hmm. point you know that at some point, you know, the left sometimes instead of just like tackling an issue head on mm -hmm. and, and and countering all the BS, sometimes the left just just goes, "Oh my gosh, there's I can't argue with uh, with, with this avalanche of right wing yeah, yeah <laughs> talking yeah. points." I so I'm just gonna like put my head down. Hopefully, it goes away, and uh, I don't mm -hmm. know. Try to try to mobilize a few people, but. I think when we talk about the left and so forth, we have to talk about the white left and the black left. And they're not often overlapping. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of things that the white left will focus on that is just bogus to a lot of folks who are black leftists. Like we're not trying to ally with white supremacists who may have come to Jesus on on a particular issue, right? We're not trying to do that, right? And they always like to cite Fred Hampton mistakenly misunderstanding the way that he approached allying with groups like that. Um, he insisted that white folks work with groups like that. He didn't insist that black folks work with people like that. That's the difference. Um, so I think it's very important to stay on subject here that we talk about white left versus black left. I saw plenty of, um, of tweets and social media posts um, from people who were black leftists defending affirmative action, um, emphasizing the importance of affirmative action for not just black folks, but for queer people, for the Asian American community, Latino, Hispanic folks, and for white women as well. Right, emphasizing the essential role it has played. I don't remember seeing the same level of interest and engagement on the issue from white leftists or folks that I identified as white leftists. Even if they maybe posted something about it here and there, it wasn't like they didn't really go on and on about it the way black leftists seem to. Um, 
So I would that would be my answer to that question. It depends on which what leftist you're talking about. Are you talking about the black side of leftism or are we talking about the more white um side of leftism? Because they usually are very split on a lot of different issues. Um, especially to touch your racial issues. Yeah, no, and uh and 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 uh, in fact even 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 sometimes when we do agree with you know white leftists on mobilizing against uh a particular war should be you know it should be all wars there's always uh -huh. yeah there there's 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 problems and we've and we've uh -huh. and we've we've, we've even dealt with it on the program before mm -hmm. and it's and it's and 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 it's uh you know and it's very frustrating and that's a perfect segue going back to what you were saying which is white feminists and, and, and you know and, and, Asian, and, 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 Asian, and Asian American groups uh -huh. benefited from affirmative action and yet they were vocal opponents and were used by the far right to over I would not say that white feminists were vocal opponents of affirmative action white women for sure but white feminists I mean I have been I honestly don't follow uh I, many at all especially when i was active on twitter but the ones that i did follow even if they didn't post much about affirmative action i don't remember seeing a bunch of like anti-affirmative action content from white feminists um okay. what i saw was just generally like white women especially along like the folks who are moderate and conservatives those white women very vocally against it right but white feminists i can they have they have their faults white feminists they have a lot of faults um but i did not see among their faults really against affirmative action um there seemed to be at least a recognition here that uh hey this is helpful um <laughs> so um but but again it's another it's an it's a i think it's very important when we're talking about who uh, who was supportive of affirmative action, who really tried to fight for it and who didn't, that we recognize the importance of the racial dy dynamics at play, and that we also recognize the importance of some of the class dynamics at play as well. Um, because there is this, I think, sentiment sometimes among folks who are staunchly middle class, and I saw this in college as well, among folks who are staunchly middle class, uh, an upper middle class, that if someone from a poorer background who is Black um, or Asian or Latino, Hispanic, whatever, gets something over them, gets hired over them, gets into a university over them, that it's not deserved. Mm -hmm. And it's, well, it's not like my middle class family can just afford to pay for this university flat out and I deserve a scholarship too. Why do I have to be so, why do I have to be so poor to get that scholarship? It's an interesting um, hostility that they have because it's a well-founded hostility in a lot of ways. What they're really mad about is means testing. Is what they're really mad about. They're mad that they, as a Black middle-class person from an upper-middle-class background, was not entitled to the same scholarship that a poor Black person was entitled to. That's not a problem with affirmative action per se. That's a problem with means testing every single thing that we do in this country. Um, that said, um, you know, sometimes there's a time and a place for a certain level of means testing, right? Um, I had a professor in law school who, uh, I think she's second generation Nigerian American. I can't be for sure. Um, born and raised in Texas. And she wrote an article about whether the intended initial beneficiaries of affirmative action we're actually benefiting from affirmative action. Um, and it's a really good law article. And what she saw in that law article is that affirmative action is actually had actually been leaving behind a lot of the original intended beneficiaries who are slave descended black Americans. Leg what she referred to as legacy black Americans. Instead, a lot of beneficiaries tended to be uh, people who are of mixed race um, and black, so mixed race black, as well as uh, folks from immigrant backgrounds, immigrant black, and many of them coming from upper middle class backgrounds, ironically enough, 
right? Um, and so in her assessment, a certain amount of means testing actually needed to be put in place to make sure that the original intended beneficiaries of affirmative action are actually benefiting from it. How can we put certain kinds of mechanisms in place to ensure that some of the Black folks that we're accepting into Harvard or wherever based on affirmative action are actually from slave descended and sla the, the background of enslaved per, you know enslaved people how can we make sure that there's a d amount of there's a decent amount of class diversity also represented among the black folks that we're admitting right because otherwise what she was seeing is that it was turning out to be this homogenous sort of demo of the upper middle class folks who were from immigrant backgrounds and mixed race backgrounds rather than from um, an enslaved history Right. Um, so I understand why some people that I that I've come across and that I went to college with felt like, well, you know, why am I not getting it? I'm also black and I come from this, that, and the other. Um, and again, I will say that what they were what they were mad about was means testing and maybe feeling like the means testing wasn't done well enough or in the right way. And I can understand that. Because diversity isn't just race. Diversity has to be class as well and gender, as well as sexuality. It has to kind of include all of these things, right? But, it's, but, that's, fasc but, but that's fascinating in that, I, you know, I just, I, just, I just find it astonishing that, uh, that a policy like that, it reminds me of all of the, it, it reminds me of, of all the arguments that people use against welfare, which is awful, uh, uh -huh. because, because, <laughs> <laughs> because mm -hmm. because as you mentioned affirmative action this actually helped out a lot of poor black people and probably mm -hmm. would have e and, and probably even helped out all of those uh middle class black people and different oh, yeah. people of marginalized disadvantaged backgrounds to Very get much. the university they'd want to go to get the job they want to go to and yet Amazing how they always manage to be the very people to end such a program, which actually that's the thing. Them. And because, because just like you, because like what you were saying about the white women and the uh, Asian Americans, that reminds me so much of you know, when the Reagan revolution came about, you had these, you had these. Let's call them stupid. You had these stupid white working class men and women, but mostly men, white working class men who were all supportive of, of you know, deregulation and uh, mm -hmm. and and, mm -hmm. and you know and, and racist attacks on their fellow black and brown, uh, you know, working class men, women, and even the non-binary. I would assume, and yet the and and yet you know all of those cuts that Reagan did to you know welfare and then later Clinton mm -hmm. completely uh you know remodeling welfare and, or and him ending welfare as we know it ending big government mm -hmm. actually the very the very communities that impacted the most were the working class uh you know white communities uh -huh. the, mm -hmm. you know those who did factory type of jobs those who did farming uh, jobs, those who did any sort mm -hmm. of, you know, lower mm -hmm. income mm -hmm. type of jobs, whether it was working at the mom and pop shop or working at, you know, Safeway, Walmart, mm -hmm. you name it. So mm -hmm. and it's, I, I, I just find it astonishing. And Well, you know what it is? It's a misdirection of anger. It's a misdirection of anger. I think, um, you know, I think I think about that one case. Uh, it was Fisher. It was definitely Fisher v. University of Texas. And this white girl, Abby Fisher, um, uh, who got roasted relentlessly on social media just for being like the most, like, of course, you're mad about affirmative action, right? That kind of person. And it's just a, it's a total, <laughs> it's a total misdirection of anger. It, it really is. Because a lot of times these folks, like some of the Asian community that was represented in this most recent Supreme Court case, similarly, they're looking at in the university space, they're looking at an admissions process that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And they're seeing people get in that really shouldn't be able to just easily get in. But they're getting in because mommy and daddy went to school there and donate. But instead of them being focused on that level of inequality that's preventing them from getting in, they allow their anger to be targeted towards 
the very people who really aren't the ones with power in a situation, right? Which is poor folks who are getting in through affirmative action. So they allow themselves to get their anger directed towards those folks. And, but if you were to talk, if you were to sit down, probably, and maybe I'm being idealistic here. But my sense is that if you were to sit down with some of those uh, plaintiffs, uh, who are, you know, I think they were, I think some of them were Chinese American. They were more like, um, like uh, affluent from what I could tell too, some of them. Um, and the, this particular Asian student group that was represented. If you were to sit down and talk to them, as well as Abby Fisher, and like actually lay on a table who's really getting into these universities and who's getting funding and whatnot to attend, who's getting all the scholarships to attend and so forth, and lay that out for them so that they could see that it's actually a lot of legacy uh, students, people whose parents went there, people whose parents are donors and whatnot. They're not only getting acceptance letters, but they're getting all the scholarships. I guarantee you, those folks would change their tune. But that's not the information they're getting from the anti-affirmative action you know, activists who scoop them up and use their anger as a weapon against affirmative action. They're not giving them that information about who's really getting in. So to me, it's just one of these situations where you have a lot of folks who are very nefarious and they have a lot of money to find people who've been harmed by a system that really is at its core unjust and it's not affirmative action that's part of the injustice but it's part of this is it's a system that is generally unjust they find those people and they use their anger like a weapon and those folks have no clue how ridiculous um, they sound in the face of the actual facts when i realized just how many um folks who get into these elite universities already come from affluence, right? They already come from all kinds of money and connections and so forth um, to the point where they don't even need the connections of Harvard or Yale or exactly. Brown University or whatever. When I really started to understand that they were also the ones getting offered the scholarships, right? They didn't have to ask for the scholarships. See, those of us who don't come from that background have to know to ask for them or we'll never even get those kinds of scholarships, right? These folks may not even have to ask for it. It may just be offered to them, but their privilege may enable them to know to ask for it as well. My husband is a great example. Went to the University of Chicago, elite school. Did not realize that he could potentially get his MSW fully funded, right? Um, so he didn't ask because he didn't know because he comes from a poor background. Meanwhile, some of his affluent counterparts in the MSW program Full, full rides. Didn't even need it. Mommy and daddy are loaded. They didn't even need a full ride. He needed a full ride. Didn't even get offered a full ride. They knew to either ask or they got offered a full ride. The ways that privilege works, um, class privilege works. That's what makes me so mad when I look at these folks who allow themselves to be used as a weapon against affirmative action. A lot of them are not as privileged as they think they are. And they are essentially um refusing refusing to see or failing to see that the real danger here is that they are advocating for the removal of a program affirmative action that will essentially cement um uh an elite group in this country right that will essentially make access to these institutions only available to the elite right not even available to them anymore only available to the elite I just don't understand how they don't recognize the system, you know, what they're creating. I don't understand how they don't recognize it. Um, but at the same time, I, I do really think that if you sit some of those people down, you give them the facts, they'll change their tune. They'll be like, oh, it's not affirmative action. That's the problem, but, but, actually. But but it's interesting because, uh, be, because uh, I mean, one of these, but I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because Maybe the Asian Americans who were involved in, uh, you, you know, who were who were involved in this case. Now you now you say that 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 they were from an affluent background, right? Yes. 
No, some of it seemed like some of them, from what I read about some of them, it seemed like some of them came from a slightly affluent background. And when I say that, I mean like middle class, you know, and okay. maybe upper middle class. I wasn't seeing any of anything about some of those students being like from super rich backgrounds. It seemed like they were from middle class and upper middle class. These were the folks who like they did everything parents told them to do. They got like the graded, they got the best grades, they did all these extracurriculars and all this kind of stuff. The stuff that your middle class parents and upper middle class parents tell you to do because you need to do it because they can't just pay your way through everything right they did all that and still didn't get in because some less qualified affirmative action uh person got in right um which usually means some poor black person who was not qualified yeah honestly that's the racial coding right and um but so when i say affluent i mean affluent okay. compared to affluent compared to the people who they perceive as benefiting from affirmative action right but then but okay but then that leads to but then that leads to this very i was even i was even planning on uh, you know on asking about this but that leads to a very important question on the role of the middle class for a lack of a better word yes but, uh whether it's the mm -hmm. affluent middle class what we call the upper middle class and the lower the middle up, class yeah. who yeah. i who, who i sometimes call the precarious middle class because yes. even if because even if their parents make just enough just uh -huh. enough to pay rent go on a vacation every now and then and maybe even get them to go to an overpriced uh, mm -hmm. uh public mm -hmm. slash private university a lot of the times, you know, the middle class uh, can be mercenaries, basically. Yes, <laughs> like, for they the should, rich. Like, like they should the be on the side, like, like yeah. they should be on the side of socialism. They should be on the side of working class movements because what helps out that class helps out everybody. And I and that gets and that gets to the point point that I was making I think a lot of times these people lack the facts and like if you really lay out the facts right in front of them they'll be like wait a minute I'm not I don't want to be like you said a mercenary for the rich they're the problem and whatnot I've had this wrong the whole time I could be completely idealistic here but from conversations I've had with folks that I thought I was like, you are so misguided. I don't know if there's any hope for you and then I have a I have a longer conversation with them and I lay out the facts and suddenly they're like, wait a minute, what? Um, oh, our taxes are paying for that. They, they don't pay any taxes. They're able to write off their yacht, whereas a teacher can only write off $300 that she spends on her school supplies. What? So it's like when you put the, the details, the facts in front of folks from middle class backgrounds, because they have this whole, I work hard and I deserve, you know, I deserve these things because I work hard. It's like you lay out the facts and they start to realize these people up here didn't work that hard. These people down here are actually working really hard. Why am I against the folks down here? Right. Well, but you, it's, go ahead. No, it's no, just go ahead. so hard to find the, the way to like actually engage in these conversations with people because we're all so isolated and we're all in our own little like, you know, spaces and enclaves. And it's just, but the conversations have to happen because otherwise we're just all going to keep saying, same, you know, same stupid stuff and allowing ourselves to be used by those who don't mean us any good. Then what do you, then, then you know, it, it's, it, it's funny because when you, when you hear a lot from, you know, Marxists and people from working class background who are involved in, in very good people power movements, uh -huh. uh, trying to strengthen, uh, you know, unions uh, of all kinds, including teachers mm -hmm. and, and you know and you know and healthcare workers you know every now and then you'll always find out one you know marxist especially one from you know a working class background who has just this hatred of like the bourgeoisie and like when they say oh, bourgeoisie, yeah. it's like it, it's it's like a cat, cat you know coughing off like you know a hair ball oh and i get it <laughs> like i get it deep-seated hatred sometimes for like the middle class way more than for the upper class because the middle class sometimes plays a very mercenary role sometimes. And sometimes yeah. you cannot trust them. And sometimes they are our yeah. enemies from within. Yeah. And yeah. so, so, so I, I get I, it. So I, yeah. So I, I wanted your, you know, response to that. And how do we get to, a, and how do you think we try to get to a place where, where the middle class actually unites with the working class? Because I find there are so many, incidents where 
where, where, where the middle class should be our allies, particularly the lower middle class, uh, you, you know, the ones who also have to, you know, work three jobs when they're when they're at whatever overpriced university to pay rent or to pay right. for their future debts that they're going to be having. And there are some who also, you know, have to jump from internship to internship being uh -huh. paid nothing or being paid, you know, very, you know, minimally. And some are just, and, and some the moment, you know, they end up working at, you know, McDonald's or end up working at like a night shop or a gas station. Uh -huh. They're already, for me, they're already part of the working class. They're already part yeah. of, you know, the working class, especially if their parents really don't want to help them out or their parents can help them out, but or, or their parents can help them out, but that means they got to move, back in with the yeah. parents and they have to deal with, with again, working three jobs to try to find their own uh, yeah. accommodations or a better job. If that better job ever comes around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I understand the folks that are, you know, who are, you know, consider themselves very socialist or Marxist and they can't, they are, they're working class people and they have a, like an allergy to middle class folks or the bourgeoisie, I get it. Um, as someone who came from a very working class background, and most of my family, like ninety nine percent of my family, is still working class, and for, and I happen to not be anymore, right? Um, like, I I struggle actually, true, like really connecting with folks who don't come from that background, who don't come from a working class background, who who were born and raised middle class or bougie so to speak i struggle with it um because they do have a very different way of of going through the world like their worldview is very different it is that whole i got what i have what i have because i deserved it because i worked hard and my parents worked hard and there's not a good there's not a recognition at half the time of the of the role that luck plays in it sometimes and when you account for other kinds of factors like race sometimes with white middle class folks there's not a recognition of the role that race plays into it, right? That made them lucky. But I also think that we're all very much in a very precarious situation in the United States. If you're if you're not rich, things are very precarious here. And um, most people, I mean, and this is true for middle class and upper middle class as well, are one semi-major medical emergency away from bankruptcy in this country and my, my in worked, my mind so, so something you've yeah. worked on very closely uh, the last several years of your life right yeah that's a big area that i that my work focuses on but most folks are one semi semi major semi semi major i would say medical emergency away from bankruptcy in the united states it doesn't matter if you are middle class upper middle class or working class all it takes is one just almost bad medical emergency um, that re results in an emergency room visit and and uh, anesthesia and all kinds of other things, and you might end up slammed with thirty thousand dollars or more in medical debt. That even uh, a good majority of middle class people can't afford to just fork over, right? Um, that may have you start making decisions that poor people have to face every day, like should I take out this payday loan or this car title loan, this high interest loan? to pay this bill. So I think that as much as I understand the allergy that some working class activists have about dealing with middle class people and the bourgeoisie, I think it's very important to recognize that that group presents an opportunity for engagement. And a lot of times it's a matter of laying the information out in front of them. Because these are folks who pride themselves on being busy. I cannot tell you how much middle class people pride themselves on being busy. Oh, I'm so busy. I got so many appointments. My calendar's full. They pride themselves on being busy. And because of that, they're not, they don't take in a lot of information about what's really happening out there. And so if you are an activist, a Marxist activist, a uh, socialist activist, and you have the ability to engage some middle class folks on, on these issues, I think it behooves you, quite honestly, because the connections, too, that middle class people often have can go a long way towards helping elevate whatever movement 
you are trying to get off the ground, whatever um, work you're trying to get off the ground. And I just think there's an appetite, um, an understated appetite among middle class people right now to understand what they could do to make things better for themselves and for everybody. But yes, there's a lot of bougie that can be really tedious and annoying. I was in a neighborhood association meeting last week and it was a neighborhood associations are hotbeds of the bougie. It's just the most relentlessly bougie annoying. And there was just this long conversation that went on about some Habitat for Humanity homes being constructed in the neighborhood. And oh, what's it going to do for property values? And and how is this? How are the taxes assessed on it? And what kinds of people are we moving into these homes and this kind of thing? Just, just really anti-poverty kinds of sentiment coming from folks. And if you're like me and you're sitting in those meetings, you're kind of thinking to yourself, "Why do I bother? Why do I bother?" But I also know that if you get some of those people alone individually and you talk to them about how Habitat works and why it's important and why it is great for the neighborhood that these are being built um, and the types of people that it helps and all this kind of stuff and how easily they could have been in that same situation where Habitat was their only option. You talk to folks one-on-one, -on -one, you can actually break down these silly walls that they have. But it just is one of those things where how do you do that? And honestly, how do you scale it? In terms of activism, how do you scale that? And I don't know how you scale it. I just know that one-on-one, -on -one, people are not as ridiculous as they seem on the surface, is what I can tell you. <laughs> on top of on, on top of the fact that uh, yeah. you, you know that that the way the propaganda system, the way the capitalist propaganda system, is you know not only uh, it, it, it not only is trying to target the middle class, the people who make just enough that they mm -hmm. that you know that they are comfortable uh with their lives mm -hmm. but but yeah but but again those are but 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 again the system does not work out you know for like you know the middle class certainly doesn't doesn't work out for the working class and those people who are who as you mentioned are just one paycheck away from bankruptcy the moment uh heaven forbid they get into a car accident or they have a health emergency or somebody or, or a loved one of theirs has you know the same thing mm -hmm. they're very quickly you know they very quickly face a civilizational downgrade and they're and they're yeah. you know, poor overnight working, working and they get that overnight, so. and they get that and i'll tell you i'll tell you no quicker way to reach middle class people than to get on a topic of medical bills and medical debt in the united states people have no idea what's actually possible once you end up in medical debt and once you once you make it clear to them that yeah you could be arrested for medical debt. Yeah, you could have your wages garnished. Oh yeah, you could have a lien placed on your home just because of a medical bill. And so forth. once people actually realize all of that is possible, all the middle-class protections they think they have start to look real flimsy real quick. And they start to understand why we need universal coverage, why we need this, that, and the other. But you have to somehow get the time and the, the opportunity to lay all that out for them. Because I can't tell you how many people I've brought that up to just on the medical side of things. And as soon as they hear it, they're like, civil arrest warrants? What are you talking about? What's a civil arrest? Um, they're like, liens on my home? What are you talking about? Nobody, No middle class person wants to feel like they've done everything right in life. They've saved, they've invested, they have a home that they own all this good stuff. And then they just happen to be like a regular human and have a stroke. And all of a sudden they lose their home. All of a sudden their wages are garnished indefinitely, or they are facing a couple of nights in jail or more. No, there's not one single middle class or upper middle class person you mentioned that to who will be like, well, some people just need to not get sick. That's, you know what I mean? That's not, <laughs> yeah. it's like, a, it's, an, it's one of those very obvious ways that they, that you can help people see that we're in this together. That like literally, if you're not rich, we're in it together, right? It's one of those very obvious ways. Not every issue is that obvious though. Um, um, some issues, it takes a little bit more to make people understand if they're not poor, how it affects them. So, but I like to start with bridge issues with people. And I think medical debt is one of those bridge issues that everybody gets.
you know, before we talk, but, but, but before we talk about some of the stuff that's going on within the queer community, and uh, uh, I wanted then to to ask you uh, now, one of these days, I'm gonna have to have you back on the program with somebody from either. Black Power Media, or hopefully Margaret Kimberly of of uh, Black Agenda Report, because I want to talk about you know the whole uh, issue of of, uh, of of the U.S. Constitution, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you, you know of you know of the U.S. Constitution and so forth, and yeah. uh, and so do you think that uh, are you of the opinion that we need a whole a whole new Constitution of the United States or or the or the U.S. Constitution, however flawed it is, there still isn't a lot of good in it, and we and and we just need to reform it, reboot the whole thing. That's my opinion. I came to that conclusion in my last year of law school when I was in a gender and I think it was gender and race class, um, and we were tasked with reading the constitutions of some other countries, and one of the and I like. Literally every other country's constitution we read was better than ours from the ground up, right? Um, I read the Iranian constitution. It was great outside of some of the religiosity. It was great. There was a, if I remember right, there was a human, there was a right to housing embedded in that constitution, if I remember right. Um, I What other one? I think there was Ecuador. One of, one of the countries, and I think it was Ecuador, um, read that constitution, Um several other countries' constitutions. And the one that I always uplift, though, is the South African constitution. And one of, the professor of that class was a, had been consulted on that constitution, actually. So she had a lot to say about it. Because if you remember, when South Africa rebooted its constitution, um, quite a few years after apartheid was overturned, they rebooted their constitution. It was like a decade or more. Um, they consulted experts from all around the world. Uh, in their in their redrafting of a new constitution, and it shows because if you look at the South African constitution, it feels like the kind of constitution that should exist in the twenty first century, right? Um, that that's interesting. Just the, just the language, just looking at their preamble, just the language. Um, so I think we just need to do over. I think when you look at our constitution, it feels antiquated. I don't know why we keep trying to update it to make it work when really at a, at a foundational level, it just wasn't meant to work for anyone who wasn't a white male landowner. It just simply wasn't meant to work for anyone who wasn't from that background. But we keep tweaking it, thinking we can make it better. And instead of just recognizing it's a piece of paper, why can't we start over? It's a piece of paper. So many countries do this when they have like a huge sort of like movement to change things in their country one of the first things that they'll do is rewrite the constitution i think chile tried to do it most recently um so many other countries don't seem to look at their constitution as this unchangeable thing they seem to recognize it as a living document that can be changed or even just thrown all the way out to start over from scratch you know i think cuba recently made some changes to its constitution as well um so I think we need to change our opinions about how we view that document and stop viewing it as this unchangeable thing or this thing that we have to always have and then just make some little edits here and there and recognize it's just a piece of paper. We can literally create another piece of paper. So final literally. question. So final question, because I know you have to go, unfortunately, right? <laughs> but we can always continue this in the next uh, conversation. So then, so, 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 so the final question, yes, we're going to have to uh, talk about, uh, the plight of the LGBTQIA plus community for another time. But then final question uh, would be though, when it comes to the constitution of the United States. So would you say that, 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 that those particularly on the white left who want to, uh, and even, so, uh, you know, and, and, and even some on, you know, the other kinds of left, the black left and so forth, who do want to, reform the constitution and get rid of you know uh neo dickensian racist laws like uh like like the three strikes laws repealing the clinton crime bill uh -huh. ending uh -huh. the drug war and approaching and, and approaching drug abuse and so forth as a mental health issue or public mm -hmm. health measure and, a, and and from a racial social justice lens mm -hmm. pe 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 people can do that no no problem but 
were, but 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 the people power movements are selling themselves short by not actually advocating for why don't we have a whole makeover on the constitution? Yeah, completely I think reasons. yeah, I think they're I think the movements are absolutely selling themselves short by not recognizing that literally we could just start fresh with a new paper. <laughs> I think this, 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 like this help, just being so hell bent on like keeping this document and just making some tweaks. It's very, it's almost like a religious sentiment that people have around this document. Like we just, you know, the Bible's fine. We just need to, you know, reinterpret a few things for the 21st century. And it's like, well, maybe no, actually, maybe we don't need it anymore. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's served its time. Maybe it was fine for its time. And now we can move on. Um, our constitution, it's it's similar like it was i won't say it was fine for his time but you know it served its purpose at this point it's time to move on we're in the 21st century the language is just simply antiquated there's not even the word human isn't even in this document for goodness sake it's just like it's a ridiculous document to continually hold ourselves by especially when we have so many examples of other countries with younger constitutions that we could easily lift from we don't have to even start. We don't even have to like make this all up. We don't have to reinvent the wheel or anything. We can literally lift straight from other constitutions that are newer than ours and that were written with, with diversity in mind and with current uh, worldviews in mind around housing and all this kind of stuff. Um, I just don't know why we think we can't just burn the thing and start fresh. I don't get it. It's, it befuddles me. Well, Unfortunately, we're going to have to end it there, but uh, but but this is a good uh, but yeah, but this de this is definitely a conversation that we definitely are going to revisit, especially if heaven forbid, Pumpkinhead uh, has his comeback and and and, <laughs> marches, into, and marches into the White House. <laughs> Although I have a feeling with this current Supreme Court, don't we don't even need to worry about like you know some far right Republican. I think the Supreme Court is already doing a lot already. of damage already by itself and, uh, and i mean and that's the thing we don't want these people redoing doing another constitution we need a whole new congress if we're going to redo the constitution but uh that's a whole other conversation exactly so. and uh and the democrats uh yeah and, and, and the democrats are also part of the problem but yes you're joined on this edition of one plus one with bernita l haynes who is a fantastic consumer lawyer, environmental lawyer, and people power lawyer by day, and, a, and an independent sci-fi fantasy author by night. <laughs> I'm going to make sure that people link to uh, to where they can check out Bernita's work. And if you're a, if you're a writer, if you're a struggling if you're a struggling writer and you're having writer's block, Bernita has a group that actually helps out uh, you know writers uh, through all of that. So Bernita, thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to uh, getting you back on the program whenever we can, all right? Yes, thank you for having me. I look forward to the next talk. Always a pleasure. <laughs>